So we slowly worked our way over the uh, pile of rubble, just one person calling out and listening. When a building collapsed in Glasgow in 1993, firefighters had to find anyone alive under the rubble. They used a very simple method. We shouted into the pile of rubble until eventually we located uh, the voice of a woman, a very faint voice, and then we found a hand. A life was saved, not with any complex technology, but using techniques that had been developed 50 years before in the thick of war, when thousands had been buried alive. by the Civil Defence Forces will ever be told, but London thanks them with a special word of gratitude and admiration for the firefighters. Once again, the capital survives a vicious blitz. I must have come to, I was buried like a little brick coffin. Couldn't move your arms, your legs, couldn't see, couldn't open your mouth couldn't actually move, and, I, and I, I was saying to myself, my God, I'm buried alive. And then I could hear my father shout, and he said, uh, keep calling and they'll hear you. But the people were walking on me. And you could actually feel the people's pressure pressing on your face. It wasn't their fault, because they were trying to find us. It's a, ter it was a terrible thing to get buried alive. And those people who rescue you, they must be very, very brave. It was men like these who rescued the thousands buried alive by German bombs in World War II. Some were too young, others too old to go to war. But most of them were builders. They were formed into civil defence rescue squads, a dad's army of the rubble. We had a squad leader and then three tradesmen who would be a carpenter, a plumber and a bricklayer. I was a plumber, so that's how I fitted into the team. And I was second in charge of the, of the squad. I think despite the rigid trade separations that occur in the building industry, we all realised we were working with a common purpose. That was to keep people alive, to get them out of trouble. I said to the people in charge, I said, well, I know precious little about what the first who's got will have to do. He said, well, mate, you're in the same boat as the rest of us, because we don't know either. In their training before the war, the rescue squads had been given a completely misleading idea of what effect the bombing would have. The training, unfortunately for us, was based upon the idea that bodies would be flung to the tops of buildings. And of course, it was far from the truth as far as London was concerned. It was all burrowing down into the rubble and finding bodies underneath the rubble. When the blitz came, the rescue squads had to go out in the thick of the bombing. They were woefully ill-equipped. The only things we had was a dustbin lid against incendiary bombs. If we come up against any of them, all we had was a dustbin lid to protect ourselves. Then we had a bucket of water with a, a syringe up there, you know, and if there was an incendiary bomb, one would have to hold the hose, like, like that, and the other one would have to pump away and set it out with this hose. This is the only crude instrument we had when we first started in 39. The Civil Defence had nothing, nothing at all. When you went into a bomb building with all the ballast and concrete and timber all caving in, 
you see something, you pick up a bit of old timber and put it under and push it up there and wet it in for safety so that it didn't come back on you and all that kind of business. night of November the 10th that the German planes hit the pub known as the Exhibition. We were able to cut a hole into the pub through the rubble and amongst it all were several round objects that appeared to be brown and I thought well what are these objects? So I leaned forward and touched and it was a woman's knee. It was her knee and the silk stocking of her knee was like sticking through the rubble. Of course, needless to say, she was dead. In fact, very few were got out of that incident at all. We did come across a, a, how can I put it, a cavity within the rubble of four men sitting around a table playing cards, and one man still had cards in his hand, despite the enormous impact of this bomb. The death toll was heavy, but the real horror was kept from the public. Over 7,000 were being killed every month, and scenes like these were never allowed to be shown. But thousands survived, buried in the rubble. The rescue squad struggled to free them. Some took days to find. It was unexpectedly gruelling work. We had picks and shovels. But mostly, the tools you used was just on, on the end of your hands. Because you couldn't use a shovel if you knew there was a person underneath there because you were liable to shove the shovel into them. So it was your fingers all the time. Picking up bricks and throwing them away. Sometimes it was broken concrete you had to pick up. And no matter how you handled it, wore your fingers out. We used to have um, those come from the army on leave. And they was allowed to come into our mob, voluntary, and do two weeks' work on their leave and get paid for it. So we had one bloke, he was a commander. <laughs> he was only out with us three days. He said, F this, he said, I'll be glad when I get black back to my the uni. He said, I've had enough of this. Yes, he did. He did wanted to turn it in. By the time the Blitz ended in 1941, the once amateur rescuers were becoming professionals. There was a three-year lull in the bombing. Then the Germans launched their secret weapon. You heard the flying bomb coming from miles away with this terrible strident rattle like a dozen motorbikes without silencers. But strangely enough, people preferred to hear the rocket motor fighting, firing because as soon as it stopped, it would dive and you were in uh, severe, serious danger of being dismembered and shredded up into mincemeat. Doodlebugs destroyed buildings by blast, not by fire so the firemen had fewer fires to fight. Some joined the rescue squads, who, by now, had developed a set of expert rescue techniques. The rescue leader would say, going to call for silence, and uh, they'd shout around, and of course there'd be uh, 50, 60 people on an actual site, and he would say, quiet, 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 and there'd be a hush descend over the area. And it was quite dramatic in a way. The lights were shining and people were there, this great heap of debris. And he would say, are you there? Can you hear me? Listen, shh, you dear boy. Oh, oh, oh. And you knew where they were and you had to crap and find them. And you had to dig them out or pull them out. We learned by example, by experience. I remember saying to a woman, get off the debris, you must get off the debris. And she looked in my face and into my eyes and she said, my people are in there, my family are in there, and she was really bereft. I took her by the arms, I said, now calm down, 
we're out to get them out, but you must get off because you're probably standing on them. One of the greatest mistakes it was to rush in and tear at all the rubble. You know there's people there and you want to tear everything apart. We had to be cool and calm and approach the job in a such a way as to not cause any more discomfort to the people who are actually trapped. And this could only be done by taking the stuff away very, very slowly and gradually. It was a tricky old business. You could very easily get hold of a ball to pull it out, thinking that you were going to clear a bit of area and you'd bring an enormous mass of um, loose debris down on top of him. And so one of the arts that we learned to do was that we tunneled in the debris. The best training exercise we had was when they had some miners come from South Wales to tutor us more in the skills of tunnelling, which, of course, was right up our street. As a tunnel was dug, then certain parts of it would have to be propped up. This is where the skill of the carpenters came in. They were able to make shoring up the equipment, you know, with blocks of wood, bits of wood, uh, even bits of concrete sometimes. And you learn. There was only one way to learn that, and that was by doing it. I remember hearing the doodle bug, and it was very loud. And then it was darkness, and the smell of burning, and smoke, and dust, and the debris everywhere. I remember Mum saying, I wonder if anyone will find us. And I said, well, we're cool, we're cool. And I remember calling and calling, help, help. We're here, we're here, please, please. And someone's saying, we're, we're coming, we're coming. And Mum's saying, come in the front door, we're in the front room. And then eventually you hear them moving the rubble and you could hear the voices getting louder. And then you see sort of light and then someone pulling you out pulling you out into the fresh, fresh air. At war's end, the rescue skills so painfully learned weren't lost. Now, the threat was not Hitler's bombs, but Soviet atomic weapons. A nuclear war will have something to do with every single person who is able to stand up and walk. Everyone must have some idea of what to do. Civil defense volunteers kept up the old techniques. Right, Jim, you start. Rescue party here? Can you hear me? But in 1968, the Civil Defense Corps was disbanded. Some feared their special skills might be lost for the only other rescue service were the firefighters, who had little training in freeing anyone buried alive. So firefighters could only have had a dim memory of what they had learned in the war, when bombs next came to Britain. On September the 15th, 1984, IRA bomber Patrick McGee checked into the Grand Hotel in Brighton. He planned to blow up Margaret Thatcher and her ministers at the Tory party conference four weeks later. In his bag was 20 pounds of gelignite and a timer, which he hid in room 629. At the conference, the occupant of that room was the president of the Scottish Conservatives, Sir Donald Maclean. I don't say I was aware of an actual explosion, but certainly of a blast of searing heat, and then nothing else after that for a few moments. When I did come to, I was fixed in amongst the rubble, dust, running water, and hadn't any idea of really where I was or what had happened. The bomb had been devastating. 
It had blown a hole five stories deep through the heart of the hotel, sending tons of bricks and timbers into the basement. In the chaos after the explosion, ambulance men tended to the walking wounded. Inside, firemen had located the first trapped casualty, conference organiser Harvey Thomas. He had been blown three floors down under the rubble. Was there anyone with you in that room? No, nobody at all. Nobody at all in that room? But others were still unaccounted for, buried somewhere in the rubble. The Brighton firefighters remembered the old wartime techniques. They called for silence. When I entered the actual hotel itself, it was eerie. We were listening for somebody calling out. We were listening for voices. And once you had heard a voice, then you could aim towards that voice. Initial cries or calls, but no response whatsoever. And I was very much on my own. Eventually, there was a voice response to the calls, which uh, cheered me up more than somewhat. First of all, all we saw was his head, and he was overhanging like a precipice, trapped, nothing he could do, he couldn't move, and we had to get down to get him out. Below us was about 80, 90 foot drop into the, into the foyer, so we, uh, it concentrated the mind somewhat. It was like the game you used to play as a kid, when you used to have your lollipop sticks and throw them on the floor and pull them away and you lost when something moved. And sometimes when you moved the bit, they all collapsed. We were well aware that if we moved the wrong bit, not only would, in Donald McLean's instance, would he go down, but we'd go with him. We started to get on a bit of a high, the firefighters, because we were very successful in rescuing uh, uh, Harvey Thomas on an upper floor. We knew that we were well into the rescue of the, the Tebbets below. So the sort of feeling that got around was, was one of a high, and we were going to get this guy out, come what may. First thing we did was try to protect him, so we put a helmet on him to make sure anything else coming down wouldn't obviously hurt him, and then tried to keep talking to him. We started to get hold of some of the pillars that were laying around, and we put the pillars as cushioning between him and the, the bits of wood, the sharp edges and so on. Now they had to cut him free, but they found their heavy rescue equipment was useless. We were firstly finding rubble, then a large bulk of timber, then a piece of carpet, a mattress, so there was no way you could have used heavy implements for that. Uh, the only implement I can remember using at any time was, a, was a, a Stanley blade or a knife itself to actually cut carpet from around him. What we had to do, really, was attempt to get him free by using basic implements like knives and our hands. And we slowly moved that that was digging into him away, got a line round him, and managed to drag him clear. One, two, three, go! Well done, well done. was aware that I had had a bump in the head and that there was a little blood around uh, my left eye, I think it was, and um, arm and hands were a little painful. We did it in short jumps, pulled, held, pulled, held, got him up to where he was now not in a danger of falling back down into the basement area put him onto a stretcher and actually took him away via an aerial ladder. I was extremely relieved to find that uh, there was no obvious major injury at all. And it was great to get out and see early morning dawn. That night, when faced with the challenge, the firefighters had rediscovered the old wartime methods. The process used at the Grand Hotel in 1984 would have been the same process used after a bomb raid in 1941. There's somebody in there that you believe's alive, then you've got to take your time, you've got to do it piece by piece, you've got to make sure while you're doing it that the crew with you are safe and that the person that's trapped 
isn't going to be made any worse. The mid-80s saw the rise of new rescue technology. It was hoped this would transform the process of finding and extricating people buried alive. Firefighters trained with a listening device called a vibraphone. It could detect the slightest sound. A special camera was tried out. It was said to be able to locate people by their body heat when they were buried deep in the rubble. But when put to the test, the technology failed to live up to the hopes. So in 1993, Strathclyde firefighters went back to basics. A three-story house in Glasgow had collapsed. One person was believed to be trapped, an American woman on a visit to her relatives. It was a classic World War II rescue. We slowly worked our way over the uh, pile of rubble, calling out, just one person calling out and listening. We shouted into the pile of rubble until eventually, after about five minutes, we, we located uh, the voice of a woman, a very faint voice. And then it was just a matter of, of trying to home in to um, that place where we thought she might well have been. She was about maybe 10 or 15 feet down inside this pile of rubble. So we had to dig a hole, uh, not going straight down, but at an angle, uh, which took a long time because we had to think about every single piece of rubble and wood that we pulled out. As at Brighton, despite all the technology at the firefighters' disposal, it was patient, slow digging with little more than their fingers. We eventually found a hand. That was the first thing we located, was a left hand. It became apparent to myself that she was getting very, very cold. So I had to call up to those above me. Um, and asked him to send a doctor. As we got further down into the rubble, we discovered that she was entombed by timber, which had actually protected her as she'd fallen through the, the um, collapsing building, which was an absolute miracle. And indeed, in my opinion, it was these timbers that actually saved her life. They had modern jacks, blocks and airbags, but it was basically the old World War II techniques that were used to tunnel through to rescue her. We had to really uh, burrow, we, we, we had to almost mine below this rubble. Eventually, the great moment arrived and we knew that we could move her. And what a marvellous, marvellous experience it was. There was a huge wave of emotion because it isn't very often under a building collapse of that magnitude that you have such a happy ending. And it was a happy ending. And I was very glad to be involved in that. The woman is now safely back in America after her ordeal. Like those rescued in Brighton, she owed her life not just to the firefighters of today, but to those unsung heroes of World War II. In one branch of rescue, little has changed in half a century. I don't believe any of the World War II skills have been lost. And even now, with all our sophisticated equipment that we've got, what you need to do is just pull pieces of the debris away, and the best thing to do that with is your hands.